billions and billions coming in, and I think we're going to get there. I do. I believe it more strongly now than I would have believed it a while ago. We're going to get there, and we're going to have a really uh, we're going to have a fair deal. But remember this: when you say fair, China has been taking out of this country 500 plus billion dollars a year for many, many years. Many, many years. It was time to stop. As a private person, I used to talk about it. It's one of the reasons I'm president. And we're in a great position. Our country's doing well. Our unemployment numbers are the lowest they've been in over 50 years. Our uh, unemployment numbers for African American, African American, Asian, for Hispanic are the best they've ever been. Historic numbers. Uh, we're in a very strong position. Our consumers are strong. Walmart just announced numbers that were I mean, mind-boggling numbers. It's a great poll right there. That's the ultimate poll. How are the retailers doing and how are certain, certain companies doing? So we're doing very well, and I think that uh, I think we're going to make a deal with China, and I think we're probably, eventually, we're going to make a deal with Iran, too. But why are you optimistic they'll change their behavior? It's not a question of behavior. I think they want to make a deal, and I think they should make a deal, and I think if they don't make a deal, it's going to be very bad for China. And I very much appreciate the fact that they came out last night, very late last night, and they said, you know, they want to make a deal. They wanted to be under calm circumstances. It was a little different kind of a statement. I thought it was a beautiful statement. I thought it indicated a lot. Go ahead. Here we go. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for you on next year's G7 summit, but can I just clarify something you said? You mentioned earlier today. One question. Go well, ahead. let me do the clarification, and then I'll get to the question. No, no, no. You talked about One calls question. with China and a breaking news alert. I'm trying yeah. to understand what specifically you heard from China. And on next year's G7, you alluded today, dropped several hints about Miami, about Doral, and yeah. hosting next year's G7 at your property. What reassurances, if any, can you give the American people that you are not looking to profit off the presidency? Well, I'll tell you what. I've spent, and I think I will, in a combination of uh, uh, loss and opportunity, Probably it'll cost me anywhere from three to five billion dollars to be president. And the only thing I care about is this country. Couldn't care less, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. People have asked me, what do you think it costs? And between opportunity, not doing things, I used to get a lot of money to make speeches. Now I give speeches all the time. You know what I get? Zippo, and that's good. And I did a lot of great jobs and great deals that I don't do anymore, and I don't want to do them. Because the deals I'm making are great deals for the country, and that's to me much more important. Uh, Doral happens to be uh, within Miami. It's a city. It's a wonderful place. It's a very, very successful area of Florida. Uh, it's very importantly only five minutes from the airport. The airport's right next door. It's a big international airport, one of the biggest in the world. Everybody that's coming, all of these people with all of their big entourages come. Uh, it's set up so – and by the way, my people looked at 12 sites, all good, but some were – two hours from an airport, some were four hours from, I mean, they were so far away. Uh, some didn't allow this, or they didn't allow that. With Doral, we have a series of magnificent buildings. We call them bungalows. They each hold from 50 to 70 very luxurious rooms with magnificent views. We have incredible conference rooms, incredible restaurants. It's like, it's like such a natural. We wouldn't even have to do the work that they did here, and they've done a beautiful job. They've really done a beautiful job. And what we have also is Miami. And we have many hundreds of acres, so that in terms of parking, in terms of all of the things that you need, uh, the ballrooms are among the biggest in Florida and the best. It's brand new. And they want that. My people wanted it. From my standpoint, I'm not going to make any money. In my opinion, I'm not going to make any money. I don't want to make money. I don't care about making money. If I wanted to make money, I wouldn't worry about three billion to five billion because that's what I mean. At some point, I'm going to detail that, and we'll show. Uh, but uh, I think it's just a great place to be. I think having it in Miami is fantastic, really fantastic. Having it at that particular place because of the way it's set up, each country can have their own villa or their own bungalow. And the bungalows, when I say, they have a lot of units in them. So I think it just works out well. And when my people came back, they took tours. They went to different places. I won't mention places, but you'll have a list because they're going to give a presentation on it fairly soon. They went to places all over the country. And they came back, and they said, this is where we'd like to be. Now, we had military people doing it. We had Secret Service people doing it. We had people that really understand what it's about. It's not about 
me. It's about getting the right location. I think it's very important. Jonathan? No, not at all. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, President Macron said he'd like to see talks between you and President Rouhani within weeks. Uh, does that sound realistic to you? Could you see yourself does. in talks with the Iranians within well, weeks? Well, it does. I, I don't know the gentleman. I think that I think I know him a little bit just by watching over the last number of years what's happened. I tell you one thing: he's a great negotiator. But uh, he, uh, I think he's going to want to meet. I think Iran wants to get this situation straightened out. Now, is that based on fact or based on gut? That's based on gut. If they want to get their situation straightened out, Jonathan, and uh, they're really hurting badly. Their inflation, as you know, because I saw you reporting on it, uh, their inflation is through the roof. Their economy is tanked entirely. The sanctions are absolutely hurting them horribly. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. They're great people. I don't want to see that. But we can't let them have a nuclear weapon. Can't let it happen. So. I think that there's a really good chance that we would meet. Jeff, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Another follow-up from what the President of France said. He said that there might be a need for compensation to Iran. Uh, would you, given all of the criticism you've made of the JCPOA and the money that they got, be open to giving Iran compensation no. if it met some of the criteria that you no. laid out? What he's talking in terms of compensation is they are out of money and they, meet, they need a short-term letter of credit or loan. No, we're not paying. We don't pay. But they may need some money to get them over a very rough patch. And if they do need money, certainly, and it would be secured by oil, which to me is great security. And they have a lot of oil, but it's secured by oil. So we're really talking about a uh, letter of credit type from, facility. From the U.S. or from the uh, it, it would be from numerous countries in numerous countries, and it comes back. It would be, it would expire, it would be paid back immediately and very quickly. Yes, go ahead, please. Go ahead, yes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, now it's Aoyama with the Asahi Shimbun, a uh, Japanese newspaper. Uh, now the, Just left uh, now the US. Your Prime Minister, Abi. Good man, <laughs> great man. Okay, and the uh, you now <laughs> the U.S. and Japan has have an agreement uh, in principle, which you said is a tremendous trade deal for the United States. So um, and for Japan, I yes. would say. Uh, oh. So, um, so are, are you still considering imposing Section 232 tariffs on Japan's auto exports to the United States on national security grounds? Not at this moment, no. Not at this moment. Well, that's one of the reasons we made the deal. But no, not at this moment. It's something I could do at a later date if I wanted to, but we're not looking at that. We just want to be treated fairly. You know, Japan has had a tremendous trade surplus with the United States for many, many years, long before I came here. And I'll tell you something. We're transforming our country. We're taking these horrible, one-sided, foolish, very dumb, stupid, if you'd like to use that word, because it's so descriptive. We're taking these trade deals that are so bad, and we're making good, solid deals out of them. And that's transforming our country. That's, that will be transformative and very exciting, I think, for our country. Very, very exciting. Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I didn't actually say you. I said the woman behind you. So why don't we do her first? You've been asking a lot of questions all day long. Thanks, Mr. President. Yamiche, I'll send her Don't say I don't give you access, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. President. Yamiche, I'll send her with PBS NewsHour. Yes. Why do you think it's appropriate to invite Russia to the G7, given that they've meddled in the 2016 election? And are you worried that if Russia does come to the G7, that it might hurt you politically because it's only going to be a couple months before the 2020 election? I don't care politically. I really don't. A lot of people don't understand this. I ran one election, and I won. Happened to be for president. I don't care politically. I'm going to run another election. I think I'm winning based on polls that we see. Uh, whether I win or not, I have to do the right thing. So I don't do things for political reasons. Is it good? Probably not. Maybe it is. I mean, a lot of people are smart. A lot of people say having Russia, which is a power, uh, having them inside the room is better than having them outside the room. By the way, there were numerous people during the G7 that felt that way. And we didn't take a vote or anything, but we did discuss it. My inclination is to say, yes, they should be in. Uh, they were, really, it was a President Obama. I'm not blaming him, but a lot of bad things happened with 
President Putin and President Obama, one of the things that happened was, as you know, what happened in with a very big area, a very, very big and important area in the Middle East where the red line was drawn, and then President Obama decided that he was not going to do anything about it. You can't draw red lines in the sand. You just can't do it. And the other was in Ukraine having to do with a certain section of Ukraine that you know very well, where it was sort of taken away from President Obama. Not taken away from President Trump, taken away from President Obama. President Obama was not happy that this happened because it was embarrassing to him, right? It was very embarrassing to him. And he wanted to, Russia to be out of the what was called the G8. And that was his determination. He was outsmarted by Putin. He was outsmarted. President Putin outsmarted President Obama. Wait a minute. And I can understand how President Obama would feel. He wasn't happy. And they're not in for that reason. Now, I'm only thinking about the world, and I'm thinking about this country in terms of the G7, whether it's G7, G8. I think it would be better to have Russia inside the tent than outside the tent. Uh, do we live either way? Yes, we live either way. Is it politically popular for me to say that? Possibly not. I think a lot of people would agree with me, frankly, but possibly not. I do nothing for politics. I know a lot of you aren't going to, you're going to smile at that. I do nothing for politics. I do what's right. And people like what I do. And, but I just do what's right. If I wanted to go strictly by politics, I'd probably poll that. And possibly I'd say, oh, gee, I don't want, I don't want Russia in. But, I really think it's good for security of the world. It's good for the economics of the world. Remember, they're building a big pipeline in Europe, going right up to Germany. And I said to Angela, who I had a great relationship, but I said, you know, you pay Russia billions of dollars, and then we defend you from Russia. Why and I say, how does that work? misleading statement that Russia outsmarted President Obama well, when did. other countries have said that the reason why Russia was kicked out was very clearly because they annexed Crimea. Why keep repeating what some people would see as a clear lie? Well, why it was annexed during President, I know you like President Obama, but it was annexed during President Obama's term. If it was annexed during my term, I'd say, sorry, folks, I made a mistake. Oh, sorry, folks. President Obama was helping Ukraine. Crimea was annexed during his term. Now, it's a very big area, very important area. Russia has its submarine. That's where they do their submarine work, and that's where they dock large and powerful submarines, but not as powerful as ours and not as large as ours. But they have their submarines. And President Obama was pure and simply outsmarted. They took Crimea during his term. That was not a good thing. It could have been stopped. It could have been stopped with the right Whatever. It could have been stopped. But President Obama was unable to stop it, and it's too bad. Go ahead. As the G7 host next year, you are allowed to invite other countries to come, guest countries, even though they're not necessarily part of the overall group. Would you consider inviting Vladimir Putin under those well, circumstances? I don't know that he'd accept it. Those are tough circumstances. He was a part of G8. And all of a sudden, he's not out or he's not in. So I think, John, actually, that's a pretty tough thing for him. You know, he's a proud person. Would I invite him? I would certainly invite him. Whether or not he could come psychologically, I think that's a tough thing for him to do. You have a G8, now it's a G7, and you invite the person that was thrown out really by President Obama and really because he got outsmarted. President Obama, pure and simple. And don't forget, it was not just Crimea. It was the red line in the sand. And Obama said, never violate the red line in the sand. And then they went ahead and they killed many children with gas. It was terrible. And he did nothing about it. I did, but I was there years later. I did something about it, but I was there late. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you help us uh, understand the timeline on the China calls? Were you referring to the statement by well, we've had many calls. Uh, or Secretary Mnuchin is here, and you've had many calls over the last 24 hours, but certainly over the last 48 hours. Uh, we've had many calls, not just one. This isn't one. And these are high-level calls. They want to make a deal. And by the way, I think a deal is going to be made, but they want to make a deal. So the, the Chinese are saying that there weren't any particular The Chinese are not saying that. Not Excuse me. Let, let me explain something. 
the vice chairman of China. Do you get higher than that other than President Xi? The vice president, the vice chairman, it's like the vice president, the vice chairman made the statement that he wants to make a deal, that he wants to see a calm atmosphere. He wants it all to happen. That says it there. I don't have to talk about, you know, you folks were reporting before, well, we can't find any phone call. He released a statement. I didn't release it. He released a statement. But there were phone calls, sir, Mr. President. There were phone calls. Numerous calls. And not only with Steve, there were calls with other people, too. Just so you understand, China wants to make a deal. Now, whether or not we make a deal, it's got to be a great deal for us. You know, and I told this to President Xi, who I really respect. I really do. I have great respect, and I like him, too. And he's a tough guy. But I have a lot of feeling for President Xi. He's very outstanding in so many ways. But I told him very strongly, I said, look, you're starting up here, and you're making $500 billion a year and stealing our intellectual property. We're down on the floor, lower than the floor. You can't make a 50-50 deal. This has to be a deal that's better for us. And if it's not better, let's not do business together. I don't want to do business. Forget about tariffs for a second. We're taking in tremendous amounts of money. Forget that. I don't want to do business. Now, when I raise and he raises, I raise and he raises, we can never catch up. We have to balance our trading relationship at least to an extent. And they were unwilling to do that. And we'll never have a deal if that happens, but it's going to happen because they have to have a deal. And as far as phone calls are concerned, Secretary of the Treasury and other people have been receiving many calls, not receiving, back and forth, many calls. China wants to make a deal, and if we can, we will make a deal. We'll see. Uh, Mr. President, if I could ask you a little bit about your China strategy. Yeah. President Macron talked a little bit about instability and the worry in the markets and in, around the globe about instability. One of the things that that comes from, as you, as you talked to me. You're talking about, about global economic instability? Right. I well, don't consider it instability, that it but that's comes from is the back and forth and the changing statements from yourself so that on sorry the it's the way so I negotiate so my question is is that a strategy is it a strategy to call President Xi an enemy one day and then say that yeah. relations are very no, good no, next no. day it's, and then you know I mean it's gone back it's the way I negotiate it's done very well for me over the years and it's doing even better for the country could, could I think you talk a little bit about and I do think works, and know? I do think that uh, look here's the story I have people say oh just make a deal make a deal they don't have the guts and they don't have the wisdom to know that you can't continue to go on where a country is taking 500 billion, not million, 500 billion with a B, out every single year, 500 billion dollars. You just can't do that. Somebody had to do this. This should have been done by President Obama. It should have been done, and Biden, Sleepy Joe. It should have been done by other people. It should have been done by Bush. It should have been done by Clinton. Double Bush. It should have been done. I'm doing it. Let me tell you something else. North Korea should have been done a long time ago. I'm doing it. I'm doing a lot of things that I shouldn't have to be doing. Please. Go ahead, please. Uh, Beth Rigby, Sky News. President Trump, you've met our new Prime Minister Boris Johnson yesterday. Yes. You said he was the right man for the job on Brexit. I believe that. Do you think Theresa May was the wrong woman? And do you think that Boris Johnson can actually get a deal with the EU before October the 31st? Well, Theresa was unable to do the deal. I gave her my ideas as to doing the deal very early on, and you possibly know what they are, but I would have done that. Uh, she chose to do it her way, and that didn't work out so well. I think she's a very, very good person and a good woman, and uh, I really believe that Boris Johnson will be a great prime minister. Uh, you know, we like each other, and uh, we had a great two and a half days. I've been waiting for him to be prime minister for about six years. I told him, what took you so long? I think he's going to be a great prime minister, and especially after spending a lot of intense time with him over the last couple of days, he's really a, he's very smart, he's very strong, 
and he's very enthusiastic. And you know what else? He loves your country. He really loves your country. That came out maybe more than anything else. Yeah, please. Uh, Vicky Young, BBC News. Uh, President Trump, Boris Johnson is very keen on a trade deal with the USA. You sound keen on it too. Some of his critics, though, are worried that you're going to do over the UK in no, that deal no, to protect no. I love the UK. I own great property in the UK. I love the UK. I have no idea how my property is doing because I don't care. But I own Turnberry and I own in Aberdeen and I own in uh, Ireland, as you know, Dunbeg and great stuff. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think I think that I think he's going to just do a great job as prime minister. You know, it takes a lot. It's so many different elements to being a great prime minister, and you needed him. I just think his time is right. This is the right time for Boris. This is the right time for Boris. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, right here. Say who you're with, please. Yeah, sir. Robert Peston from ITV uh, in the UK as well. Um, you've obviously had a good few days with President Macron who you appear to be doing business with, to use right. your favorite expression. Um, after Brexit, who do you think will be your more important relationship? President Macron, France and the EU, or Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? I think we're going to have just, uh, look, France is a great nation. Uh, it's being run, a lot of things are happening. You know, it's not easy what he's doing. He's changing certain ways. It's a very hard thing to do. I won't get into it. I'm going to let him sell his ideas. But a lot of people don't disagree with his ideas. But it's a very hard thing to do. If you're a great citizen of France, you love your country, but you want to do the way you've been doing it for a long time. But maybe that's not working. And maybe they have to do what he has to do. I think he's going to do a fantastic job. But it's very tough for him. I know how tough it is for him. He's been having a hard time. And uh, nobody would have an easy time. But I do believe he's doing the right thing. Uh, Boris is different. It's a different kind of a deal. Boris has to try and do something with Brexit. It's very tough. I deal with the EU. The EU is that's a very, very strong group of people. They have their ideas. And they're not easy to deal with, I will tell you. We're very close to making a deal, by the way, with the EU. I have to say this. We made a great deal with Japan. And we're very close to maybe making a deal with the EU because they don't want tariffs. It's very simple. They don't want to tax cars, Mercedes, Benz, BMW. They don't need a 20% or a 25% tax. But we're very close. I think we're going to make a deal with the EU without having to go that route. I may have to go that route, but maybe not. Uh, we're going to have a deal, a really fair deal. But the EU is another one. Uh, we've been losing $180 billion a year for many years. That's a lot of money. How much can you take out of the piggy bank, but, right? But, but the alliance, which alliance will be more important, with the EU or with Britain? Both. Uh, I don't want to say which. Uh, look, I think that uh, I think that the I think we have been with. I guess we'd start off by saying England, right? You know, I asked Boris, "Where's England? What's happening with England? They don't use it too much anymore." We talked about it. It was very interesting. But the United Kingdom is a great, incredible place. It's an incredible nation. And it's, you know, been one of our tremendous allies. And another one happens to be Australia. He was here also, Scott. He is fantastic. In fact, we're honoring him in Australia at the White House in a very short period of time. Uh, but, but I think that, excuse me? Will you visit Australia? At some point I will, yeah. At some point I will. Also Germany. Uh, Angela asked me to visit Germany. We're going to be doing that too. Uh, so I just think they're very different. And they're going to be going at it for a little while, but ultimately, probably, it works out. They may have to get out. They may not make a deal. The European Union is very tough to make deals with. Very, very tough. Just ask Theresa May. Thank you, Mr. President. Zeke with the Associated Press. I was hoping you could uh, clarify. Last year, you left this summit in Canada, feuding with the summit host. This year, uh, things to me seem to be a little bit different. You're talking about unity, had a hug with uh, President Macron on the stage. What is different? And also, as President Macron said, he's passing you the baton now of leading this multilateral institution. You ran on the platform of America First. What is your now, now, you, now, you, now that you have a mandate for the international community, what are you going to do with it? Well, we actually had a very good meeting. I had it out with one or two people where we disagreed in terms of concept. But we actually had a pretty good meeting last year. I would say that this was a big step above in terms of unity, in terms of agreement. 
we have really great agreement on a lot of very important subjects. But last year was good also. I mean, last year was good also. I think last year might have been a little bit underrated. You know, go ahead, please. In terms of the G7 presidency, what do you want to do with it? What was your, what's your agenda? Oh, we're going to do something hopefully special. We're going to build on what we have now. We built on something really good. Uh, we're going to be going in with some great uh, unity. We really did. We, if there was any word for this particular meeting of seven very important countries, it was unity. I think most important of all, we got along great. We got along great. Mr. President, Go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm Ching Yi Chang with Shanghai Media Group. You just mentioned that um, Chinese uh, Vice Premier Liu He uh, said China is willing to uh, resolve this issue through calm negotiations. No, I didn't say it. He did. Yes. Yeah. And will the U.S. negotiate in the same manner? Yes. And also, <laughs> so the other issue, the that other a, question. That was an easy answer. <laughs> So the U.S. will negotiate in the same manner with Absolutely. China. Great respect for China. Great respect for the leadership of China. Absolutely. And also the other question is that you say you definitely will invite Putin to join next year's summit. I haven't said that, but I think that having President Putin in what was the G8, uh, he was a member of the G8, and I heard he was a, a good member of the G8. Having him in, I think, is more of an advantage. I think it's a positive for the world. I think it's a positive for Russia. I think it's a big positive for Russia. Uh, and it's something the group is discussing. They are discussing it. But just a few hours ago. People feel very much like me, many people. What? But just a few hours ago, Russian foreign ministers saying that it's not their foreign policy pursue to return G8. What's your reaction? Well, to that? you know, we'll see. I, I know one thing. If they were invited back, I think they'd be there. If they weren't, that's okay, too. I just think they'd be uh, better inside than outside. I mean, as I said before, I really do. I think they'd be an asset. I think it would be a good thing. You know, some of the things we were going in the room, and yesterday in particular, we were discussing four or five matters, and Russia was literally involved in all of those four or five matters. And a few of the people looked up and said, you know, why aren't they here talking to us about it? What are we going to do now, go home? Take it easy for a day, although I'm not doing that. I don't take it easy. But what are we going to do? We're going to go home and start calling them at the end of the week and say, hey, how about this? Could have been in the room. We had numerous things that we were discussing, right? Numerous. We had a lot of things that we were discussing. And it would have been very easy if Russia was in the room. If he was in the room, we could have solved those things. Now they're just in limbo. But I have to say, with all of that, very little in limbo. But somebody will speak to them about some things, and frankly, they're not very complicated. But it would be easier if they were in the room. Thank you okay. so much. Josh, go ahead. Josh. Mr. President, there was a significant talk at the summit about uh, climate change. I know in the past you've harbored some skepticism of the science in climate change. What do you think the world should be doing about climate change, and do you still harbor that skepticism? Uh, I feel that the United States uh, has tremendous wealth. The wealth is under its feet. I've made that wealth come alive. We will soon be one of the, we will soon be exporting. In fact, we're actually doing it now, exporting. But we are now the number one energy producer in the world. And soon it will be by far, with a couple of pipelines that have not been able to get approved for many, many years. It'll have a huge impact. I was able to get Anwar in Alaska. It could be the largest site in the world for oil and gas. I was able to get Anwar approved. Ronald Reagan wasn't able to do it. Nobody was able to do it. They've been trying to do it since before Ronald Reagan. I got it approved. We're the number one energy producer in the world. Soon it will be by far the number one. Uh, it's tremendous wealth. And LNG is being sought after all over Europe and all over the world. And we have more of it than anybody else. And I'm not going to lose that wealth. I'm not going to lose it on, on dreams, on windmills, which, frankly, aren't working too well. I'm not going to lose it. So, Josh, in a, in a nutshell, I want the cleanest water on Earth. I want the cleanest air on Earth. And that's what we're doing. And I'm an environmentalist. You, a lot of people don't understand that. I have done more environmental impact statements probably than anybody that's, I guess, I can say definitely, because I've done many, many, many of them, more than anybody that's ever been president or vice president or anything even close to president. 
And I think I know more about the environment than most people. I want clean air. I want clean water. I want a wealthy country. I want a, a spectacular country with jobs, with pensions, with so many things. And that's what we're getting. So I want to be very careful. At the same time, at the same time, at the same time, you weren't called. At the same time, it's very important to me, very important to me, we have to maintain this incredible, this incredible place that we've all built. We become a much richer country. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because that great wealth allows us to take care of people. We can take care of people that we couldn't have taken care of in the past because of the great wealth. We can't let that wealth be taken away. Clean air, clean water. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.